before we move to the next part of our program, I would like to thank my childhood friend from El Vedado, Paul Echanis. Paul, where are you? Yeah. Who approached us at the Bildner Center around the middle of July with the wonderful idea of having the New York premiere of this wonderful film here at the Bildner Center. And I would like to thank Mauricio and Rosalina for making it possible to have uh, this film. Uh, today. Now, uh, before, I am sure that many of you will have many uh, questions and comments about the film, but before we get to that part of the program, um, Dino Fernandez is going to, to make a short PowerPoint presentation about uh, a complementary aspect of El Vedado. Um, so, uh, Dino? Uh, this was a very special moment of very amazing. Uh, sorry, a test of what? <laughs> As you always have. But I had the pleasure of meeting Patty for the first time in February 2015 to show her the birthplace, my birthplace, our neighborhood. And it led to this four years later. Uh, Special pride, for sure. But this is the original land that we could find, the old piece of Verado. And now, this is the model of the city showing what the Verado is. It's built. Back in 1895, we began to see a whole bunch of areas built up already, but far away from the city, if you notice. Because it started growing up this end. And it grew in that way. Here is the famous farm by Ivo uh, Leon. And in comparison to the Commission of Planning that was far earlier in 1811, one thing that I want to note, because I'm sure the piece has done the grid in the Americas, that our block by and large 200 by 800 created a big problem for the city of New York that most New Yorkers don't even know. Contrary to the better plan of 330 feet by 330 feet. One of the things that you may know is New York has very shallow theaters. And it's that 200 width of block that makes it almost prohibitive. Our, our big tall buildings like the Empire State Building, it's everywhere you think. In fact, if those of you who may remember the old Madison Square Garden, yeah. we invented the three ring circuit because it was 200 by 800. So, of course, when Penn, State, when Penn Station went bankrupt, they seized the moment to move it right into Penn Station to get that. Now, 200 plus 200 plus 60 in the width, 460 foot width to make a round, big, huge Madison Square Garden. Something we have to remember. Why the quadricula in square is infinitely better than the long, narrow one. But this is 1811, though. So, you know, we had, by the middle, of the 19th century, whether it was Paris, Madrid, or Barcelona, and Havana, we learned how to do it better. All right, here, but just to illustrate the plan capture of how similar it looks to the Vedado, but the Vedado was still better. It had boulevards of different width, more green. It had streets of different width. You know, even the Ponce de which was one of the better ones. Sorry, I'm going backwards. One of the they made huge blocks with cut corners, very unusual, very special. But not that many white boulevards, as you can see, only one, one or two. And here is how, all of a sudden, at the, at the end of the 19th century, Red Island was truly growing. It developed into all these little neighborhoods. And as you can see, this is the tail end of the 1930s. It's still not reaching the old city area. The entrance, of course, the Rampa, it became. This is the 1950 product. Then he developed the, the Malacone and built it further. Mind you, it was not the Americans that built the Malacone in Cuba, okay? But they never reached the Pedado. This was done during the 1950s. And then this was the, became the new image. But you see these wide boulevards with green. The parking, different. 
totally different. This is one of the other ones. This is Paseo. Now are, but still green. This is the western edge. The new image. And this is a special one for Friday night. <laughs> this is a monument to the Chinese that I kept seeing when I was very little, going to my clinic three times a week. From higher up, because now that I climb up to 200 feet above sea level, you get this view. <coughs> but there is a problem, of course, that everybody becomes very concerned, and that's the density of high rise and how it begins to close in. Depends on the angle, though. 17th Street, the Lopez Serrano, still quite open, and this is the new residential building in Salon de Malecon. Linea cuts right through, just like Broadway does through New York. And it saves this city even more so in New York than here. This was linea, it meant that was the railroad line that ended on the western terminus, where in fact Vedado was born to grow to the east. These are the low lot lying areas. It's a, it's a problem in the city. Even though the Monacorn is quite high above sea level, it's like 10 to 12 feet. It still floods because these are low points. Once those spring water and stones stop the water, the water just goes back into the lake in here. And that's the typical view that became an envelope. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the presence of our Chancellor, Felix Matos Rodriguez. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. <laughs> And also, and, and also Dr. Carlos Riobo, the chair of our PhD program in Latin American, Iberian, and Latino studies, and Latin American studies. Thank you both for honoring us with your, with your presence here today. So, and now we will open the floor for questions and, uh, and comments. We usually take three questions at a time, and once we address those uh, three questions, we'll go for a second round. Yes. Is that due to uh, po you know explosion of population or leaving the countryside or well, something else? It is on. Yes, it is on. Okay. Uh, um, Politically, we, we, know, we po take three questions yeah. and then okay, and you then we answer them. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Uh, another question. I'm curious to know about the construction of synagogues. Uh, was, could you speak about that? One more question in the back. Unfortunately, Adele Doran isn't here with us, but I will. Um, so another thing El Bilao is known for, I'm, I'm right here to say, another thing, El, El, another thing that El Bilao is known for is maroon slave settlements, Cimarrones of which there are still, I believe, a few remnants. So I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Uh, the Cimarrones, I'm not familiar with the case in Verado, because in reality, Verado truly was born in the second half of the 19th century. And you remember that, in fact, the Spanish crown freed all the Cuban slaves way before that happened here. There is also a clearly different relation between white and black in Cuba than we have in the United States. And I will not point fingers, but there's quite, quite a shocking difference in how we deal with each other. You know, I don't know if that answers, but the Cimarron issue in Vedado, to me, doesn't sound right. No, yeah, but Vedado really started in the, in the, sec in the beginning of the second half. You know, like the, the plan was 1853 to begin with. You no, know, slavery ended 1886. 1886, was it? Well, again, you know, when I well, think of. 1868, Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, but official, yeah, officially 1886. Yeah. Well, uh, the other At question was well, 
I, I'm, I'm, I got a pleasure uh, to meet uh, Adele Doran uh, the last time we went there and on the two, I, I took many, many architects on tour to Cuba since 1992 onward, last time being in, in, in the 2015. And that was the first time that we were able to enter the, uh, the great synagogue, you know, the Patronato that we call in El Velado that you saw a glimpse of in that, in that documentary. Uh, I would take a guess at being 1954, 1955, you know, because that all happened and that leads me to the other question you had as to why. Huh? Yes, yes. Now it has dwindled, uh, to be sure. I, you may remember that my friend Alan Gross uh, uh, got put in jail for quite a few years because supposedly he took things that were not uh, permitted, you know, or were forbidden by the Cuban government. Uh, but he's finally happily living in Tel Aviv, you know. But the 1950s, uh, you know, Cuba has had a, a very undulating historical uh, path since its initial, and I'll go back to the 1868 war and then the 1895 war. And then in that final war, uh, when the Cubans felt that they were almost winning, okay, the United States stepped in and they will say into our war and turn the Cuban-Spanish War into the Spanish-American War. Consequently, uh, like uh, our noble president, Roosevelt, called uh, that terrific little war that gave us an empire. And it was just planned. Uh, we occupied the island in 1898, but the fighting continued. So it, essentially, we had to leave in 1902. And that's when the Cubans celebrated Independence Day on 20th of May of 1902. Uh, but that didn't stop there. In 1906, our Marines were back in Cuba. So we had that kind of relationship. It's always been a love-hate relationship between Cubans and Americans. Uh, but some, some governments were stronger, more stable than others. Uh, they had a few, Menocal, uh, uh, and then the Machado. Machado uh, became one who uh, wanted to build a lot, a lot of industries, the central road system, the Capitol building, you know. And then up went uh, construction, but down went freedom. You know, supposedly then he became a dictator, and that died out, and again, another period came in. In the 19, in 1952, uh, 1948, 1952, we had two presidents, Grauso Martin and Prio Socarras, but then they were suspected that there would be a communist takeover in Cuba, and the CIA sent Batista to take over. So, but the security of that gave a lot of impetus for more construction during the entire 50s. Until that ended, with the revolution. Because in essence, when the revolution began to move into uh, the, uh, the housing industry and confiscating it, well, one of the issues is if, if someone takes your home, who's going to renovate it? Who's going to fix it? Who's going to maintain it? And I'm an architect. If it's not my house, I won't do that. And that's a lot of what happened there. Now, the revolution has learned its lessons, and it's done whatever it can, and, and it, it keeps on changing. It's different all the time, if I can answer that. We can take three more questions. Can I talk in Spanish? Because so many because my English is very bad. Well, uh, <coughs> another... Uh, bueno, ano, eh, otra parte importante del vedado que no se ha mencionado y que realmente es eh, muy significativa para todos en Cuba, yo soy del vedado, vivo en el vedado, es eh, que las calles están numeradas desde paseo hasta el río 
y eh, con letras de al alfabeto, en orden alfabético, desde paseo hacia. Y eso es muy, muy importante porque no hay que aprenderse los nombres de las calles, que es la tradición española. Y la otra cuestión que me parece importante, por eso no es una pregunta, sino un comentario. Oh, translate, okay. <laughs> well, the other thing is uh, uh, that um, in, in one of the photos he, mo he showed is uh, that first Vedado was a small part. Not all the thing that now is Vedado is that, because there was El Carmelo, that is, you, you show Carmelo. it in, Correct. The, in yes. the beginnings, in the beginning, and the other part was Finca Medina. It's for 23, near, near uh, 23 and eight, 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 10, that part, where it is uh, 12, that, uh, that part is uh, uh, Medina. And then all was called Vedado, but in the initials was, uh, forgive me my English. Uh, another question or well, I, I will make one more comment, though, because of what you so, just said. And I'm not sure if I should speak in English or in Spanish at this point, but okay. uh, no. you know, one of the things about the Vedado, uh, in comparison primarily to all the other city plans we saw, is that it, it starts off with a base of a seven by seven block that is replicated between 26th Street and 12th, boom, between 12th Street and Paseo, boom, between Paseo and the Avenida de los Presidentes, boom, and then the final one that ends actually with five blocks at L, L Street. So, you know, it's not a big plan. It's not a huge plan. And the shame of it all is that when the uh, city fathers began to go east to uh, Habana del Este, you know, they didn't consider that they already had a wonderful system to replicate the Vedado there. They started doing all of this, like they were in the suburbs. And really, Havana, as at least the coastline, should not be considered to be, you know, suburban. You know, for that, you go inland. In the coast, you treat it like the rest of the city. And that was a mistake, I feel. There is buying and selling, but the market has fallen down because of um, President Trump's new regulations that don't encourage travel and don't encourage Cuban-American families here to send money to their relatives there to buy houses. But there is still buying and selling. There is still, um, there's not very many permutas. It's all strictly buying and selling because the money is coming from outside. And it's not just Cuban-American money. It's Canadian money, it's Italian money, it's Spanish money. Everybody who has a relative in Havana is trying to buy property and fix it up. Yeah, I just want to say that I think the film was beautifully filmed. I never saw, I never saw Havana look so good. <laughs> um, and it was a beautiful film. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. The music too. It was a great vision from Patty and an and, and incredible cinematography from my buddy Stanley. He couldn't top it. In Havana, this was a, a big, depressing, nostalgic, crying session when they saw it. Any more comments or questions? Mauricio. What would be the agenda for the future? Given the restoration issues, the issues of well, Havana, they're, we're the, artistic, the artistic issues are representing Havana. And that's a question for you as well as for Mary. What comes out of both projects in terms of possible collaborations, academic yes. projects that you may engage in? Well, uh, for one, I've been involved with uh, of people from FIU, former Dean Juan Antonio Bueno, uh, at the request and bequest of uh, Nicolas Quintana, uh, who started the Havana and its landscapes. And they wanted me to actually put in uh, and terminate that work with a whole piece on transportation for Havana, of which I've already prepared a uh, whole session to be presented in Havana, hopefully in November. 
uh, to try to make a, a major impact. Uh, back in 1993, I took to Havana some documents, drawings that I had as a hobby, and they were all very impressed. In fact, it opened a lot of doors for me and a lot of credibility. Uh, one of the things was that the new young guy who took over the GDIC, Julio Reyes, uh, invited me to come back in 96 and in 98 and, and uh, to lecture the different planning workshops of the city uh, to give them you know, pointers on how to improve. I have been very interested and in, I've followed very closely the development of the Madrid Metro uh, and, and, and collaborated with them at many levels because of purely my interest. Uh, of what it was, and, and I see shame that in New York we can't even duplicate, you know, while a city that in 57 only had 57 stations that today has 320. I mean, you know, and in, in, in a period of three years, they built three lines. What? You can't build a second avenue that I have heard since I came here in 1954. So, you know, what be as it may, unfortunately in Havana, the provincial transportation uh, group feels very similar. And every time that there is an open audience, they say, oh, it's going to cost $150 million a kilometer. And they always put it down. But one of the things that I did do is that I presented to them. And in fact, in front of Patty, the new uh, director uh, acknowledged that the plans I left behind are the ones that planning has been using since 1996 to create the metro bus system. And so now they have a metro bus system. Uh, but I want to see a subway because the metro bus system fails in that all of a sudden everything is on one particular calzada with five lines running through it and it's back in the same jam that we used to have back in 1952 with the tram cars in Havana. There was one after another, 40 trams in line, you know, going from, you know, one area of the city to another. That has to stop. The city has to grow. And the shame of it all, as I tell them, San Juan has a subway, Santo Domingo has a subway, and Panama City has a subway. And all those cities are infinitely smaller than Havana. Today, with the energy problem they have, you have two million people that can't even move. They're told to stay at home, to not work. The city can't live like that. Sorry, but I had to tell you that. And that's one of the things we're doing. And one of the things that the GDAC with LESA is supporting me to push. We would like uh, to ask uh, uh, Mary about uh, the reception that the film has had in, in Havana, in Cuba in general. So I'm pleased to report that the film, they love it in Havana. We had a big opening at the Multicine Infanta um, over 200 people, um, our crew, uh, friends we had worked with, anybody whose property we had gone up high in to shoot, we invited everyone that was connected with the film, and the reception was wonderful. Then um, we showed it to the office of the historian, to Dr. Leal's group, and they loved it. We got some good criticisms from the guides. Um, why had we missed the Napoleonic Museum? Well, we missed it because we had been told by one of our consultants that it wasn't part of Vedado, and it turns out that it is. It's within one block, so we intend to lengthen the film a bit and add some of the things that were left out. Um, it's now being used by the guides group of the historian's office for training, so I, I consider that wonderful that it was accepted in Cuba as well as it's accepted here. So if you like this and you like Stanley's work, we're doing another film, and this is on colonial architecture. Um, Arquitectura colonial en las primeras siete villas. So um, colonial architecture <coughs> in the first seven cities. So it'll probably just be colonial Cuba or Cuba colonial. I like to keep the names the same in both languages. Um, this film is also available in Spanish um, with the voice of a Cuban actor as the narrator. Um, I, Luis García, Luis Alberto, siempre se me olvida el segundo nombre, Luis Alberto García. And 
and um, I'm hoping that the second film will be out in about two years, and Luis Alberto has said that he'll be the narrator for that too. So we've had great luck with the film in Cuba, which I'm really happy about. I wanted to build a bridge between Cubans here and Cubans there. And if I can do that, uh, I'll consider it successful. Thank you. <laughs> Few minutes for a few more questions, Jenny. Jenny Fluen, photographer. Um, I wonder if you could speak about the plethora of hotels that are currently being built. Is there coordination about the design? Is there how is that seen well, by architects? I'll, I'll here be the there? bad guy here. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, our our uh, our great. Uh, Helper Savior Eusebio Leal, who, who uh, single-handedly almost, and in spite of every odds in the world, tried to improve and, and manage to resuscitate at least part of the old city, wanted to continue to make improvements everywhere. Uh, however, he was removed, I believe, three years ago, all of a sudden, from his post and left simply as the historian, no longer involved, because my understanding is that now the FAR uh, has pretty much taken over all the construction uh, nationwide, and the uh, FAR uh, is simply interested in maximizing the number of hotels they build, and I'm, I mean maximizing the number of rooms at whatever cost, uh, regardless of quality. And, and unfortunately, the Cuban architects who are not hired to do this are up in arms that uh, infinitely worse architecture is being just pushed into this city, especially along the Malecon, uh, with no concept of climate uh, or anything else. You know, just just you know the same old standard that you would find anywhere else in the world, just being cookie cutter added to Havana, and that is a shame. Uh, some they've tried to do a little bit better. But by and large, these, these hotels are becoming massive. I mean, one problem that they did have was that uh, at the beginning, there was a, uh, this, this great fear that uh, tall buildings weren't light. But Havana had a history of towers, you know, much like New York, it was towers. It, it, people get used to towers. But in the case of the older buildings, uh, and I can cite where we stayed uh, in 15, in the Saratoga, used to be a three-story building, was converted to a six-story, more massive building. They did a pretty good job, but now they took all the, the Packard, and the Packard became a whole block, and that whole block ended with a big box on top of it, and now it's like eight, nine, ten stories, and it's, they're becoming massive. But the ones now, the new generation that's being built in Malecon, is the worst of all. Okay, I mean, now, now, if, if you join Facebook and you follow Cuban architects there, you can get a whole, you know, earful of what's going on, and I recommend you do, because I do. <laughs> well, the main one is the Kuhai in Havana. Yes, that many, many of the students uh, of the 1950s who used to protest against Batista. Uh, will tell you, oh, we got moved over to Mariana, so we could not walk to the presidential palace and protest. Uh, and they, they did get removed, and, and they're no longer in the, in the old university site that you saw. Uh, they're in a no, newer building of, of 50s, 60s vintage. And yes, it's a very large, prominent school. Very capable. Any more questions or comments? Maybe. Mariano. Mariano. Is there work being done to capture the history and the dynamics of the neighborhood? The city, right? I, I don't understand. Mariano is a city? By here, I'm, I'm losing my hearing. <laughs> Is Mariana receiving the attention? I'm not familiar. Mariana. I'm really not familiar. I haven't been back since 2015, so I haven't kept watch. I mean, my, my main interest has been, you know, really just to try to help and push the GDIC. 
you know, with, with no support from the government anymore, you know, to continue planning and continue pushing good ideas. But it's I don't know what happened in Mariana. It's a lot to be done with uh, Armendariz. Well, they did, they did Monte Barreto, okay? They developed that whole uh, big, what is it? It's like eight, ten blocks by five block area that was derelict space right off of Fifth Avenue in Miramar uh, for many years. And they built huge hotels there in Monte Barreto. And that's all I did see, you know, that was like about 15, 20 years ago. And the, the area of the, um, uh, the, the, the Melia uh, Havana was built, and then the Triton got two towers and so forth. You know, the, the, but they're pushing hotels. That's basically what they're doing. You know, one last question. Is sea, ri sea rise level, the sea rise, is that a problem with climate warming and waters from the ocean coming up? Okay, is that that's lucky? another issue I've been trying, you know, they, they, they <laughs> in 2015, I was named foreign consultant to the planning department in Havana. It's a bit of a joke. Uh, it's free service, but they go from one emergency to another emergency. So whenever I said to work on one, they say, no, we got a worse problem. So I got to jump to the next one, but yes. One of the ones that I've been working on is the development of how to prevent the intrusion of water. In the case of Miramar, I have not focused because Miramar always was very low-lying ground. It's like dealing with it in Miami Beach, if you know what I mean. Uh, but in the area of Vedado or even Old Havana, the fact that the Malecon was built, and it was built between 10 to 12 feet above sea level, it really has managed to save the city from humongous floods. I mean, we, we have a flood five times in Miami. You know, they don't have that in Havana. And, and the, the only problems in Havana that they have is because they haven't addressed how to, how to, how to do anything. You know, they, their attitude is, we don't have any money. So with that answer, they do nothing. And it's a shame because they can do something with minimal effort. I mean, there are times when I know that there's 600,000 unemployed in Havana that could do something, you know? And in fact, I remember the, it was a big joke when well, one of the things that I'm working on, which is the subway, when they started building tunnels on 23rd Street and the very top of, of Vedado, and, and I, well, I, I didn't mean to make a joke of it, and I said, but you know, at least you could use it for every shelters because you keep talking that, you know, we're going to invade them. So, but they didn't like that. But the point is, they did build tunnels. You know, use them. You know, uh, it, it, again, it's it's a situation where they jump from one thing to another and they never focus on resolving one uh, completely. Right now, the main focus again is hotels and only hotels. You know, every other construction, and you would be able to tell us more because you go to, to Havana more often than I do, that it's really probably, probably more Miami money that is what's saving the rest of the city than anything else. People sending money to their relatives. And that is when you see these houses being renovated, painted, fixed, little by little. The government doesn't do that, you know. And that's what actually I think is making the city come alive. Hopefully it continues. Uh, one last question, because we are reaching <coughs> the end of our time. Hi, I apologize. I did miss the film, but um, my fascination with Cuba is not diminished. I actually have a big question mark over Cuba in my mind. But um, I, my question is about tourism. And if there, what's the main source of tourism? And if it is a thing that Cuba would like, to have happen, and also part two, just to put on top, because we were talking about infrastructure, uh, highways. Are there any highways? Highways? That, because you were talking about uh, oh, backed up uh, streets. You know, the, the situation with highways is is very, very much the same situation with rail. I mean, we we allowed in, over the last for 50 years for the rail lines to deteriorate. You know, one of the pushes that I made was to 
have them save the rail lines in order to make at least the ones in, in the in metropolitan area of Havana to turn into in, what they did finally, listen, into the interurban line system, all right? But the condition is, is terrible, all right? Uh, highways, for example, I know the story of a guy who I met here, actually with you, Mauricio, who was working in the, in the office in Havana to design the autopista. And he told me here, in, <laughs> with you, with Bilner, that they kept arguing with Fidel to make only a two lanes in each direction. Where they would be able to build it from Pinar del Rio to Santiago. And he insisted on three lanes so that he could land airplanes wherever. Well, the superhighway, the autopista, only reached Santa Clara and never got to come away. That's the story, OK? That's the situation. And in fact, what they, I remember when we came back from, um, from Cienfuegos, and I was sitting close to the chauffeur in the bus, and uh, we had been leaving Cienfuegos in a brand new road that cut from, um, I think, Abreus, something like, I forgot, Aguada de Pasajeros to Aguada, Cienfuegos. Aguada de Pasajeros. <laughs> I just remembered. Aguada de Pasajeros to Cienfuegos, a little straighter, except that that superhighway was like this. And the bus was, you know, <laughs> really, not flat. And all of a sudden, we get to, you know, nearing the monumental avenue that was designed by Batista. And all of a sudden, the name Batista mm -hmm. came out of his mouth. And he says, look at this one that they built in 56. It's still in great shape. What else can I tell you? Thank you, everyone, for attending today. And uh, thank you to the Ibrahimi Family Foundation, to Stanley Staniski, Mary Ibrahimi, and Secundino Fernandez for this great session, and of course to Mauricio Fontan, the Bildner Center, for making it possible. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.